Welcome to episode 176 of the Ski Podcast and thanks for joining us, listener. Today we're going to be discussing the new National Snow Week coming up this autumn and we're going to be looking at low-carbon ways of travelling to the Alps, including train travel to Austria and electric vehicles to France. My name is Ian Martin. I'd like to introduce my guest today, Babsy Lapwood. Welcome back to the Ski Podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And also today, we have Steve Morgan from the National Snow Show. Hi, Steve. How are you? Very good. Thanks, Ian. Always a pleasure to be here with you. Excellent. Now, a question I like to start off with is, when did you last ski or snowboard? Babsy, I'm going to start with you. When were you last on snow? Um, when uh, I went to MTA um, S in Banff. So how long is that going? Now, four weeks ago, uh, end of March. Um, yeah amazing it was and pretty... they had a lot of snow over there this winter yeah really good really good end of season still lots and lots of snow um even fresh snow it was really good yes okay i i've never been to banff but i have been watching race across the world very addictive program that my family really love and they stopped in banff on that show i don't know if you've been watching it when they had yeah, to I have, there, yes. the, uh, uh, the gondola up there and did you ski in any other resorts while you were over there well, so we went to um, Sunshine and Lake Louise um, just, you know, one day at each of those resorts. And then we went to um, Panorama for our family holiday. OK, now I've got to say that yeah. I've got a question lined up for you because we talked, uh, you know, in the green room earlier about an incident that happened in Panorama. I wondered if you uh, would consider talking us through that. Yeah. So uh, in the first 10 minutes, our oldest son broke his um, leg really badly yeah it was it was it was awful but um the snow patrol was amazing the people there were amazing um exceptional so yes so in terms so so pretty bad start but you're saying i mean he, he was was he airlifted off the mountain is that what happened or um no um no they they got him down um before i even got down the mountain um there were six of them there um they got him down and then they um, took him to the closest hospital, um, but they couldn't do very much. Uh, so they private jetted him from Cranbrook to Vancouver uh, to see a specialist. So, yeah, amazing. I mean, thank God for travel insurance, right? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, thank God for travel insurance. And how's he? Is he he's a young man. He's probably recovering very quickly. Is, how's he getting on? Yes, no, he's much better, much, much better. It was a really bad break. It's sort of, um, it was his thigh bone, so it, it splintered rather than just a clean break. So he's got plates and everything. Um, he he now thinks it's quite cool, but it was quite traumatic. Uh, I'm sure, uh, sure. <laughs> as as the mum, it was extremely uh, traumatic. Well, well done yeah. for getting uh, getting over that, and I hope it didn't, uh, you know, spoil your memories of uh, Canada. Uh, Steve, I think you've got a, a young family as well. Has that affected your ability to to get on snow? Have you been skiing this winter? Yeah, so I'm super jealous of Babsy. He's uh, <laughs> my last snowboarding. Uh, soiree isn't quite as glamorous it was but hey, some might say not quite as glamorous it was at the snow dome in tamworth um so that was my last bit of well i don't know snow fake snow yeah call it what you want but um yeah my excuse is a two-year-old son so um i'm i'm homebound at the moment but i'm sure that will change as soon as i can get him going Yep, well there'll be plenty of there will be plenty of opportunities and i can assure you it gets easier as they get older babsy um, honestly, though, um, I, I can't recommend Panorama high enough. The, the resort was absolutely amazing for families. I mean, if you ever get the chance, you're at the bottom of the because obviously I couldn't go with Aaron and James. So I had the other two still. And it was just so easy and, and you know, amazing runs. I mean, that was pretty special. Apart from the incident, obviously. but um, <laughs> The incident. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, uh, that, Canada is another place that goes on to uh, my endlessly growing uh, bucket list. 
Uh, my last skiing, I think, if I recall correctly, was in uh, in Verbier. Didn't get to go anywhere in uh, April, and usually uh, for this year, just didn't quite fit in. I've got my children are doing GCSE, so we had to decide that we weren't going to go skiing. But I do hope to go skiing uh, later this summer, um, maybe a day or two in Zermatt if it goes well. And before that, I will actually be in Les Trois Vallées doing a bit of hiking uh, out there. And uh, regular listeners will know that the Ski Podcast is sponsored by Les Trois Vallées. It's the largest ski area in the world. And depending when you listen to this, you can actually still ski there in Les Trois Vallées, in Val Terrens, uh, which is the highest ski resort in Europe, until the 8th of May. Uh, actually, this weekend is uh, La Grande Dernière, their closing weekend. Uh, and we do have a snow report from Alex Irwin, who's a regular snow reporter of ours from Courcheval, who's been out there skiing. So let's have a little listen to that. Hi, Ian. Alex, 450 days of winter with a snow report from Valteren. It's the final week before Valteren closes and they hold what's called the Grand Dernier, where they organise many extra events to celebrate the end of the winter. Snow conditions can only be described as, and let me describe my thesaurus, amazing, incredible, marvellous. Wonderful, mind-blowing, awesome, flabbergasting. Basically, how you would expect the snow if you arrived on a normal February, but with 25 degree temperatures thrown in. The only downside is that everyone, and I mean everyone, is there to get a few final days of skiing. Valteren is also hosting Dutch Week. Yes, it's really called that. Where it appears that half the inhabitants of the small country of the Netherlands take over the ski resort to celebrate both their king and the spring-like snow conditions with a schmoke and a pancake. The snow and the atmosphere truly is on another level. So until summer, this is Alex from 150 Days in Winter signing off. And if you're missing the snow, feel free to come and visit my YouTube channel and maybe subscribe. Ciao. So that was great to hear from uh, Alex. Uh, even when the uh, resort closes, there's going to be a lot going on in Les trois uh, this summer. Uh, the highlight's probably going to be the Tour de France in July. Uh, hopefully Alex will report on that for us as well. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be going out there and doing some hiking across Les trois uh, during August. Now, moving on, uh, in the news, regular listeners uh, know I like to run. I kind of referred to it then. I've done a few uh, long races, ultra marathons, but nothing like what Dan Keeley from Snow Camp, the snow sports charity, is currently undertaking. He is running from the UK to Rome to raise funds for Calm. That's a campaign against living miserably and raise awareness of mental health issues. I ran with him on the first leg last weekend, and you can find out a lot more about Dan's run on Home to Rome. That's home, uh, the word, to Rome dot com see how he's progressing he's doing about 35 miles a day and hoping to do it in 35 uh, days and he's going to be raising uh, funds along the way so if you want to support him that'd be great now also news from the sports podcast awards where we were listed a uh, shortlisted excuse me in the wilderness category sadly no win uh, this year might be that the wilderness category is just slightly too broad for us it was actually won by the cycling podcast which is a much bigger podcast than us but congratulations to them and i'd like to thank everybody who voted for us and a last minute addition to the podcast I've just been sent this interview by a regular listener to the show, uh, Doug Newman from Ski Weekend, who recently spoke to Eddie the Eagle Edwards. And it's always good to catch up with Eddie. So let's have a listen to what he had to say. I've got Eddie the Eagle here and we're at X Events in Exmouth. Uh, and Ski Weekend would love to ask a question for the ski podcast. Eddie, when and where did you last go skiing? Uh, well, the very last time I went skiing was at Gloucester Ski Centre. Wow, yes. Uh, but uh, the last time I went away on snow was with Ski Weekend. Yes. with was Oh, my goodness. Savoyas. Yes. Wow. So, uh, oh, well, that's amazing. Yes. And was the snow good? It was not bad, actually. It was not bad at all. High up, lovely. And right. then, obviously, the further you went down, the most slushier it got. Yes. Uh, but you didn't get away this year? No. No, I didn't, unfortunately, because of... Uh, different issues and it was a very short season and things but um, I'll try and make up for it next year. Absolutely, well Ski Weekend would love to get you out to Chamonix. I would love to get out there, yes. Lovely. As All soon right. as possible next season. Perfect. Well, thanks I'll very much. I'll wax my skis right now. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. Good luck tonight. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now, we're going to move back to Babsy now. We're going to be talking about National Snow Week a little bit later on. 
But um, Babsy, you're from the Mountain Trade Network and you have an event coming up uh, before that this summer, which is the uh, Listex Luxury event. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. So um, that's our newest event, uh, Listex Luxury, and it's held at the South Bank Centre in central London. We've got different tour operators attending that one uh, who are mainly focused on the luxury alpine market. So not our general sort of um, Listex clientele, maybe. It's sort of high-end resorts, five to six star hotels, any sort of um, chalets. Um, And it's been very, very popular. So we've grown twice in size this year again. We expect about 35 suppliers. Uh, In the evening, we are then joined by um, 50 journalists on a private cruise. So it's a very nice event. Yeah, well, I came last year to the the forum uh, element of it where there were some presentations. And then sadly, I fell ill. I missed out on the uh, the cruise along the Thames. So I'm looking forward to coming along this year. But just to clarify, so Mountain Trade Network is a a B2B organisation. It's for people within the industry to, to network and make connections. Yeah, that's right. Right. Um, the Mountain Trade Network is a online um, community platform, similar to LinkedIn, but just mainly focused um, on the mountains, summer and winter. So we also host virtual events where people can connect virtually. Uh, for example, some of the hotels might not have the budget to travel over to the UK. Well, I know uh, in terms of our, our listeners, a lot of people are working within the industry across the world. So it is a useful resource to make sure that you're on the uh, mail list for. Now, that is a trade and press event. Uh, now, this autumn, we're, we're going to see the National Snow Week, and that is going to be relevant uh, for all consumers and everybody interest, uh, interested in the industry. Stephen, it's a pleasure to have you back on the uh, show. I last spoke to you at the end of your second successful National Snow Show, which is at the Birmingham uh, NEC. It's very exciting that this year you're going to be bringing back a show in London as well. I think we were talking earlier. It's the first one since 2019, so four years ago. I mean, long-term listeners or long-term People within the ski community might remember there were days when we had multiple shows all around the UK. Once upon a time, as well as London, we had shows in Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Southampton, and even here in in Brighton. So the London show uh, coming back is is great. Steve, how has that come about? Why did you decide to resurrect it this time around? So we have the national, or we had only the national snow show, which was just in Birmingham, and it was a great fantastic event it grew year on year which was exactly where we wanted to take it we found though that although it was a national show we were still only really capturing just outside of the m25 up into the midlands and then above birmingham so there always seems to be a little bit of a stigma between people in london going out of London and people out of London going into London. They just don't seem to like to do it. So to truly capture the whole of the UK, we decided after speaking to our exhibitor base and the audience, so our visitors, that we needed to do something in London to capture the entire UK. Right, yeah. I mean, I having been at the London show, uh, excuse me, having been at the Birmingham show for the last couple of years, I do know that... Some people are so desperate to attend. They love skiing so much that they did come up from London. But I'm sure a lot of people uh, didn't. And yet, particularly that that first show, which happened in the autumn of 2021, if I'm Mm. thinking uh, correctly. So all the lockdowns were over and it's really that very first event after uh, lockdown and people were still a little bit nervous about coming along. And I don't think it was compulsory, but some people, you know, a lot, a lot of people were wearing uh, masks, etc. And people have come from all over because people really wanted to get her back into it. And it was so exciting at that time. But so it wouldn't surprise me if there was, you know, significant demand. And obviously a London show has been going on for years. I mean, my parents uh, told me they used to go to the, uh, the London ski show when it was held at uh, the Royal Horticultural Society in Chelsea. And this is a long time ago. It might have been the 60s or something like that. So there's been a long history of it. And you worked for The Telegraph previously, didn't you? You were the organiser of the show then? Yes. So um, for quite a short stint, I was the event director on The Telegraph Ski and Snowball Festival. Um, You know, great, great event, um, but different proposition to what we've curated for the National Snow Week 
So, I mean, that event that you're talking about there most recently was held at a place called Evolution in, mm. in Battersea. And now, you know, in your new role, the company's called Raccoon Events. You're running lots and lots of different shows, not just uh, snow sports shows. But you have chosen to uh, put the London show at the XL uh, Centre. I wondered why, you know, there are obviously lots of different places. Historically, it's been done at Earl's Court before and Olympia before. And I mentioned Evolution. Why did you pick uh, XL for it? Well, our choice of London-based venues has dwindled quite drastically over the last couple of years. So Earl's Court is is no longer there. Um, Olympia definitely was on the radar. There's there's quite a lot of development and, and work going on there at the moment. So it's not quite there or, or where we would kind of want it to be at the moment. That's not saying, that, you know, something might happen in the future. But XL is, um, well, I mean, it's an exhibition uh, center as a venue for exhibitions so it lends itself very well for exhibitors and visitors being able to get easily in and out and do what they need to do during a show um, so that was really the main the main choice uh, or the main reason for choosing xl you know it's not because uh, they've got a cable car link <laughs> <laughs> because there is a cable car isn't there it goes from there, the there to Excel. you're exactly right there is a cable car and you keep an eye on our socials because we might be doing some kind of stunts and activations on on those or on there to um to get the hype going for the show itself but yes the cable cars are great um it wasn't the primary decision but it definitely you know ticked a couple of boxes for us um but i must say as well with the elizabeth line the access and routes into XL now are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been out to XL a bunch of times for World Travel Market, which lots of people in the travel industry go to. But actually, more probably more recently for the marathon, because when you when you register for the marathon, you go to XL, and it is it is massive there, but it's much easier to get to, as you say. I deliberately went on the Elizabeth Line last time because I wanted to actually try it and see what it was like. This uh, this new line, the cable car itself, I, I think uh, it was originally Emirates with a sponsor, and then they dropped out. I did write to Transport for London offering. To to sponsor uh, the the cable car from the ski podcast, but I believe my offer was slightly outside of the range of what they were looking for. <laughs> slightly, slightly disappointing. Now the the two shows are going to bookend uh, a week, aren't they? So you're going to have the show at the NEC in Birmingham, the National Snow Show, and then uh, the show at XL in London on on consecutive weekends, but. Mm. This is building into the National Snow Week. So what can people expect to find happening on those on those days in between? Because there's going to be additional activity, I think. So this is year one for the National Snow Week. As you quite rightly put, the 14th to 15th of October will be that, the, the Birmingham Snow Show, obviously up in Birmingham at the NEC. Then we'll have the London event, which will be at XL on the 21st and 22nd of October. So two large-scale consumer events which bookend a week of snow sports activity. Um, one of our main partners around this will be the lovely MTN with Babsy and Listex being part of that um, curated schedule of events during that week. Um, and our concept ideas and what we're working towards is to pull in as many of our partners as possible to do activations which are suitable for consumers to get involved with. So we're currently planning some activations with some of the snow centres, so Tamworth and and the snow centre, to do activations with brands and with potential celebrities. I mean, certainly that would be really interesting uh, in between. Is that, I can't actually recall, is that half term week in October? I've got to say, my son is only two years old, so my brain (laughs) is not switched on to those kind of term time things yet. (laughs) I think (laughs) think it varies across the country. For us, it's the week after uh, uh, London, but activities uh, that you talk about going on within the snow domes would certainly be interesting. And you mentioned, you know, personalities within the industry and certainly what's happened in Birmingham in the last few years is it's been you know jam-packed with uh, most of the names uh, that people would know from 
television, uh, you know, Jamie Alcott and uh, Graham Bell, uh, Tim Woolward and, and people like that, but also our athletes as well. You know, for me, last uh, year at the Birmingham show, I've spoken to Billy Morgan there a couple of times and, and that was really interesting. But this year, I really enjoyed uh, talking to Mia Brooks. And it was amazing to meet her at the beginning of her debut World uh, Cup year, which has just been uh, incredible and culminated with her winning the uh, uh, the World Championships uh, mm. as well. And it's that opportunity. And you know, to, I don't want to kind of um, put this in the wrong context. Yeah, I am a journalist, and I do get to interview them. But they were extremely accessible. Basically, any members of the public could come and have a chat with them, and uh, you know, they're very open. And, and I think. Presumably, that's the sort of thing that you're thinking of, you know, for London and for those, uh, you know, events that are going on, uh, you know, midweek. 100%. I mean, part of our uh, ethos, thinking, values around our shows are to make those celebrities and personalities, as you said, accessible, but really to provide the inspiration and motivation to get people absolutely stoked, loving, just fired up to get back out onto the mountains and pursue their passion if they've already got it in snow sports but also to really encourage and drive new entrants into the snow sports industry. That is, that is pretty much the core values uh, around the shows and National Snow Week and everything we do. We want to grow the industry. I think there's two things about that. I mean, we work in the industry, so it's in all of our interest for more people to do it. But the fact is that, you know, we know and uh, regular listeners to the show will know everyone I have on the show is extremely passionate about skiing and snowboarding. You know, we do it because uh, we love it and we like to share that with other people so that they can enjoy it as well. I think that's one of the things that always crops up in relation to sustainability. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, My passion and involvement with that is that, you know, I feel that uh, we want to have this opportunity for generations in the future to be able to you know, share this wonderful sport and the, the opportunities that we uh, have. Just wanted to say that um, I completely agree. Our shows are content driven and passion led. And very much like everyone, I have the opportunity and pleasure of speaking to in the industry. You can you can hear that passion come through from them. And I absolutely love listening to just all the brands, all the tour operators, all the destinations, because everyone's got their own take on how they want to develop the industry or how they think it's going or or where they're going to be taking it next. And that I, I absolutely love that part of my of my job. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you can go along to to the shows and you can find out about the new tech and the, you know, the retail side of things, the equipment that's available. I think one of the things that, you know, I've enjoyed the most, you know, I've, I've, I've been involved in it in, and I've been able to share some of my ideas via the, the kind of uh, the, the talk stages. But it's listening to some of the inspiring speakers, uh, you know, who are attending. And, you know, one of the highlights for me was two years ago. I was uh, I was at the Birmingham show. And I was just taking a break between uh, you know talking to people. I thought I'll just sit down for a little bit. And this chap was in front of me, and he was an older gentleman. And I thought, oh, you know, he's just uh, he's uh, he's having. He said, oh, I'm quite tired, but I'm waiting. Uh, you know, to, and it became apparent just from chatting to him. He was Sir Ranulph Fiennes <laughs> sitting in front of, <laughs> sitting in front of me. I didn't even realise who he was to start off with till I started to notice some of his fingers were missing. You know, from mm. from frostbite from the many expeditions that he'd done. And I know that when he stood up to speak he was amazing and the room was full it was absolutely packed and it's you know being able to listen to you know inspirational people like him that i think is is the key difference of you know attending these shows you know meeting the athletes uh, you know etc and the type of speakers that you are bringing uh, do, do you have um do you have a kind of confirmed list of speakers i imagine it's developing oh. the whole time but who's going to yeah, be yeah definitely um it, it is still developing and it is part of our marketing strategy that we kind of eat these out um as we go along the campaign but so far if you check out our website so nationalsnowweek.com um you'll see people like eve muirhead a veteran, a couple of veterans of ours. So Todd Nilsson, he'll be back. Scott Penman, I dare say we'll get Billy Morgan along again this year. Um, but the likes of Mia Brooks, she's coming back. I mean, everyone wants to hear about just the snowstorm that she's been going through at the moment, which has been mind blowing and so inspirational. Um, Millie Knight, and just to name name a few. 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, again, I said uh, that's always really interesting. We actually, uh, uh, listeners will know, we do the ski podcast live. Generally, uh, we'll be looking at going off the beaten track. I'll have a few guest speakers uh, in talking about different places. Uh, And then I'll also be doing a couple of presentations myself about uh, train travel to the Alps, going in a little bit more uh, detail about it to help people understand how they can uh, go about that. Um, That's really interesting, Steve. Uh, Babs, I'm going to just come back to you uh, uh, briefly. We mentioned Listex Luxury. But there's been a long-running annual trade event called Listex. It's the 13th year of uh, Listex. And, uh, you know, uh, I was there in the early years when it was uh, held in a you know, rowing club uh, on the side of the Thames. And then more recently, it's been at the Snow Centre. But where is it going to be uh, this year and why have you changed? So this year, it's going to be um, at the XL um, because we are forming part of the National Snow Week and obviously super excited to be partnering uh, with the shows Um, and we've just outgrown Hemel so we've we've just had so many suppliers telling us please come back to London so it's the perfect time for us the perfect partnership so very excited excellent so will that happen that'll be in that week in between will it part of those uh, you know activities yes so we actually extended Listex to three days uh, with the added press day on the third day so the first two days are the sort of trade exchange meetings between suppliers and the tour operators. And then on the third day, um, we are hosting the day with the national um, snow shows um, and be inviting uh, lots of journalists, media, you know, anyone else from the industry. We have our forums. So, um, yes, very exciting. Yeah, and just to put that in context for the listener, you know, when you're uh, booking a holiday with a tour operator, these first couple of days at Listex, this is where those deals are made, isn't it? You know, the tour operators looking for hotel rooms, or a destination is looking to bring people in. All of those conversations lead towards what gets packaged and brochured up and offered to people throughout the season. Yes, that's right. And obviously lots of new hotels are, you know, being opened in the Alps. And lots to talk about, really. The resorts are constantly staying changing talking about sustainability as well obviously very important now for the consumers well i'll be uh, hosting a panel about sustainability uh during listex in, in the autumn and you know uh, as i mentioned before and as regular listeners know something i feel very strongly about and i really find that interesting to talk about it in the uh, in the in the industry environment so listener if that's piqued your interest don't forget that you can actually get a free ticket right now for the uh, national snow week uh, events using the code ski podcast and just go to uh, nationalsnowweek.com and you'll be able to pick one of those up great i mentioned in the intro that uh, we were going to look at some low carbon ways of uh, traveling out to the alps and i was lucky enough to uh, speak last week i think it was now to uh, hannah from the austrian tourist uh, office in the uk uh, and we had a little chat about taking the train to Austria. I've actually been out on the train, you know, many times to uh, to France and Switzerland, less so to Austria. And there's a couple of new ways of doing it. So let's have a listen to that. Great. Well, I'm delighted to be joined today by Hannah Zayic from the Austrian National Tourist Office. Hi, Hannah. How are you? Hi, good. And you? I am very well, thank you. Now, I wanted to have you on the podcast because we often talk about train travel here. And, you know, I've got a reasonable amount of experience of it, but that is normally to either France or Switzerland. And I think it's important to understand that train travel is possible from the UK to Austria as well. Regular listeners may remember back in episode 90, I had Yvonne Rosenstatter from Salzburger Land on, who was talking about a train that's run uh, down from Denmark all the way to uh, Caprun. Um, But my previous experience of going to Austria by train has been to St. Anton. And when I did that, it was via Zurich. But there are a lot of options now uh, which are increasing to go to Austria thanks to the Nightjet services. And uh, Nightjet is a service from the um, OBB, serves 25 European cities. And Hannah, the reason I wanted to have you on the show is I happen to know that you've been on that uh, Nightjet service. I wondered if you could just Tell us briefly what that service is and and where it runs to and from. Yes, of course. So as you already mentioned, the Nightjet is the overnight train service from um, the ÖBB, so the Austrian Railway. Um, It has an extensive network all over Europe. As you said, it's connecting over 25 European cities. And I think it roughly transports around 1.5 million passengers annually. 
just with the night chat services. So I took the night chat myself twice last year. Uh, you cannot go directly from uh, London, unfortunately, yet. But you can, of course, take the Eurostar from London to, for instance, Paris or uh, Amsterdam and Brussels and then continue to Innsbruck, Vienna or Salzburg depending on the connection. I like the idea that you said you can't get a direct train yet. That hopefully but means that one day that, that, that might happen in the future. I, I mean when I normally, uh, I very rarely travel on the on the direct service. I have been on that direct Eurostar with Travelski. Most of the time I'm starting with Eurostar myself that would normally be to uh, Paris. When you started, you went by Eurostar and you took Eurostar to Amsterdam. Now, that's an overnight service. So how did the timings work for that, uh, connecting from uh, London to Amsterdam on Eurostar? So when I went to Amsterdam, there was still a direct service from London. But there's a train, for instance, leaving at 1 uh, p.m. in London arriving then shortly before 7 p.m. in Amsterdam. And then you could hop on the 7.30 p.m. train from Amsterdam to Innsbruck. And you actually land in Innsbruck then a uh, quarter past nine in the morning. So you have still the whole day ahead of you. What I also did is um, I actually combined it with a day out in Amsterdam. So one time I actually took an early train from London to Amsterdam, then had a couple of hours in the city, which I enjoyed just strolling around, uh, visiting a museum. And then at 7.30 p.m. I took then the night jet, jet, night jet to Austria. I, I am planning something kind of similar to that at the moment. We're looking to go to uh, Amsterdam, leave a little bit uh, earlier in the day so that we can have dinner in Amsterdam and then go on a, a new service called the European Sleeper, which goes overnight to Berlin. So same principle, what you're saying there, if you wanted to go out to Austria on the night jet service, you can turn up, have a little look at Amsterdam as well, build that into your holiday. You go and see a museum uh, like you did, then get on that train um, overnight. And so you said it leaves at 7.30 in the evening and you're arriving into Innsbruck at 9.15 in the morning. Now, my recollection of Innsbruck when I've been there, it's actually very close to a lot of resorts. When I was there, I went to Kutai, which was about 20 minutes to half an hour away. But there are quite a few resorts very close to Innsbruck, aren't there? There's quite a few resorts around Innsbruck. There's actually a ski and city pass from Innsbruck, which offers access to all the different ski resorts, plus sightseeing in Innsbruck. You could also hop off the train a little bit earlier than Innsbruck and leave at Wörgl or Jembach. And then you have easy connections into other ski resorts. So, for instance, from Virgil, it's about 45 minutes to St. Johann in Tirol, or it's about 35 minutes to Kitzbühel. Um, you could also leave at Lienbach and then take a transfer about an hour to Meyerhofen in Zillertal, for instance. So there's plenty of options. Right. And the resorts that are around uh, Innsbruck as well, you've got you've got Nordketter just above uh, Innsbruck and then uh, Kutai that I mentioned. But um... So you also have the Axa Malitzung or the Stubai Glacier. Uh, so in the Ötztal Valley, you would uh, take another train and then a bus into the Ötztal Valley to reach Solden. That would be a possibility as well. You could also take a train directly from Innsbruck into St. Anton, where the train station is directly in the city, in the town centre, uh, which is an hour from Innsbruck. So a lot of uh, uh, resorts are easily accessible. And you mentioned as well about arriving quite early in the morning, You're arriving in the morning there. You know, obviously, if you're, if you're getting off at Virgil and going on to San Johan or Kitzbühel, you could be arriving earlier. So if you left, on a Friday, on a Friday evening, uh, afternoon, for example, then you can be getting in to resort early on the Saturday, effectively getting yourself an extra day skiing onto, into your holiday. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So if you did do that, you can actually get that extra Saturday at the beginning. And then probably I'm guessing you could do an extra Saturday at the end because you'd be able to get a Saturday night to Sunday morning on the way back. So you can sneak in an extra couple of days into your holiday. Yes, that's actually true. Yeah. If you would uh, take both times the night chat, then you would get, I would say, probably one full day if you don't want to have it too stressful. If you're a very keen skier and you're going to hop directly from the train to the slopes, then it's probably a few hours more than that. Excellent. Now, this is obviously an overnight service. So what are the options for overnight in terms of, you know, beds versus seats? 
There are three uh, travel categories. So there's the seating carriage, which is the most affordable option. It has six seats per um, compartment. Those seats can be extended a little bit. And actually, you can also book the whole compartment privately. So for, for instance, if you're going with friends, then uh, there would be an option to have it to have a bit more space for a cheaper um, price. So, for instance, I did that uh, last year where we booked one compartment privately and we were two people. So it was actually last year I booked uh, one seating carriage with a friend uh, privately. So we had actually quite a, a lot of space actually for two, two people. Prices are starting. I mean, it depends on the connection and the time when you're going. And we have a cheaper price available, which is called Spaschine, which is a, a limited amount of cheaper tickets. That are available and prices are starting from around 26 pounds uh, if you can get one of those cheaper wow that's amazing but so but what you mentioned just then you're saying that's just a seat that extends that's not a bed as such no that's just a seat it basically that extends yeah. but you can it's... get what what a lot of people would probably understand if you use the word couchettes you can get couchettes as well can't you Couchette is the next travel category, which is a compartment with either six or four beds in it. Uh, so, for instance, if you're traveling with a family or with friends, that might be a good option as well. I also want to point out that there is actually women's compartments. So if you're a, a, a solo female traveler traveling by yourself and you might not be sure to sleep in a in a mixed couchette, then you can actually pick that you want to be in the women's compartment those are actually like small beds actually they include sheets pillows blankets and you also have a small Viennese breakfast when you wake up uh, and you can lock the apartment the compartment from inside their prices are starting from around 70 pounds uh, with the, the limited cheap tickets again given that's quite a long journey and having experienced it on the travel ski express where you don't have a bed it's quite hard to get comfortable unless you're unless you're kind of pretty small <laughs> it's quite hard to get comfortable just in a seat for a long journey like that so I would definitely be looking at a couchette and as you mentioned with a family you know you can do the same thing you can book a whole you can guarantee that you're going to have a whole uh, compartment couchette compartment uh, to yourself as well I think there's also a kind of top grade uh, option as well with just two bedded sleepers is that right there's also the sleeper cabin which has single double or triple compartments so it's getting even more private now uh, you have also men and women separately if you prefer to here it even includes on top a welcome drink a welcome bag toiletry towels and a wake-up service as well as a la carte breakfast uh, it also has a small wa uh, washing basin in the compartment. And if you are going for the deluxe option, then there's even the, the own bathroom included as well. And of course, the prices are higher here. But again, you can get cheap tickets if you book in advance. And their prices are starting actually from £105. OK, and those prices you mentioned, are they one way or return? This is one way. So, you know, essentially you could do that then. I think you said 29. I can't remember if it was a euro just for the seat, but, you know, 60 uh, euros, 50 pounds, something like that return. You know, if you got in there quickly, I think people understand how dynamic pricing works. You know, the earlier you get in, the better chance you've got of getting the best prices. So some people, you know, often think, oh, the train can be really expensive. But it's like all of these things. If you're organized and you know when you want to go, then you can get some really good uh, uh, value out of it. And you yourself, you've done it twice uh, via Amsterdam, been to Innsbruck and to uh, Vienna. When you went to Innsbruck, did you go skiing? Uh, no, I actually went in summer, but I went hiking. Right. Okay. You're in, you're in the mountains. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Well, th that sounds great. And it's something I really want to uh, try. As I mentioned, uh, I've done, you know, all sorts of uh, train travel to different places in the Alps and been to St. Anton, a fairly straightforward uh, connection, hoping to do that overnight uh, to, uh, to Berlin. And uh, the night jet is something I'd like to try as well. So listener, if you're interested, I'm going to put a link to the night jet uh, into the show notes uh, for this episode. And otherwise, Hannah, um, thank you thank you for uh, joining Again, us and sharing all that information with us well thank you so much for having me it's a pleasure 
So that was really interesting uh, talking to Hannah. That's definitely something I'd like to uh, try uh, going out on the night jet, doing one of those overnight uh, services. So I mentioned the Travel Ski Express, which is overnight, but I definitely prefer the idea of uh, being in a couchette. And actually, as it goes uh, this summer, I can't recall if I mentioned this in the interview, but I'm going out to uh, Nice to take part in a triathlon and I'm going out in an overnight couchette uh, from Paris. So that will be quite quite interesting to see you know, how that uh, works. Now, also, this was yesterday. I definitely know when this interview happened. I was able to speak to Simon McIntyre from Igloo Ski, and he recently uh, drove an electric vehicle out to uh, Val d'Isère in France. And, I'm, you know, I've done this a couple of times. Uh, listeners uh, will know. I'm really interested to hear from people who have done this uh, journey because it is extremely low carbon, as we uh, will discuss in the interview itself. So let's have a listen to that. Great. I'm delighted to be joined just now by Simon McIntyre, who is MD for Ski at Igloo Ski. Hi, Simon. How are you today? I'm very well, thanks, Ian. Uh, How are you? Uh, I'm very good, and I'm really pleased to have you on the show because uh, I can't remember how it cropped up, but I discovered that recently that you had driven out to the Alps in an electric vehicle, and I'm always interested. I've done it a couple of times uh, myself now. I'm always interested in people's experiences and how it's gone. Uh, Remind me where you travelled to and when you went, Simon. So um, we went uh, went to Val d'Isère um, in the second week of the Easter holidays, so the, the 8th of April, 8th, 9th of April. Um, so we drove from Surrey um, all the way to, to, to Val d'Isère. Um, and, and I suppose to, to answer the, the kind of the, the question about or, or to summarise my experience before I go into the detail, we had an absolutely fabulous experience driving out. Um, we've only been electric car owners for uh, six months Um, and we talked as a family about driving out and and thought it would be a a, a really great adventure Uh, something good to try uh, and good for yeah a a number of obvious reasons as well and yeah it was um, it was something that 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 we definitely do again Excellent. Well, that's a really, that's very good to hear. Do you want to just um, start us off by telling us what vehicle you were in and what the kind of range is in that car? Yeah. So, so we've got um, uh, we have a Mercedes, um, and that that range is, uh, or, or the, I suppose, a manufacturer's range is two hundred and fifty five miles. Um, realistically, and and again, you know, we, we've had it for six months, but probably around two twenty to thirty miles, driving very carefully and in sort of eco mode. Um, so that was the kind of the, the range that we were we were working on. Working um, with. If if you're on the motorway on your way through France, what kind of speed are you talking about by driving very carefully? <laughs> um, let me just remind myself of the speed limit. No, we um, so we, we were probably at about 75, 80 miles an hour. So, yeah. Right. OK, I've, so I wouldn't call that conservative at all because having driven okay. an electric car, you know, that that's the sort of speed that most people would normally drive, uh, you know, an ice internal combustion engine vehicle. So basically sure. you're not going any slower, but you yeah. do have have to uh, stop to charge and you mentioned yes. uh, yeah you know, your range there is about you know 220 uh, miles something like that which yeah. actually if you're going at that sort of speed is about the type of uh, distance that we as a family would normally travel but we before we take a natural stop anyway and i think you traveled you mentioned there you had your uh, family so yes how many how many times and how long were you stopping for during that journey so, so on the way out, we so, so that the holiday started or, or the hotel started on the Sunday, the 9th. So we decided to go out on Saturday and stay overnight. Uh, I suppose part of the adventure and part of the unknown, we, we thought we'd give ourselves plenty of time. Um, my, my two daughters are, are eight and nine, and it's probably the longest journey they've ever done. So on the way out, we wanted to kind of take it easy. Um, we It probably took us about... Um, about 11 hours on the first day to get to Tornus. We stopped about four times, probably every one and a half hours or, or a little bit over that sort of roughly. And I think, as you said, as a, as a family, we, we were kind of ready for that. I was ready to stretch my legs or my wife was if she was driving and, and the kids were ready for a bit of a break as well. Um, so we, we stopped and charged based on you know, what, the, what the car was telling us uh, and, and actually had quite a pleasant journey out there because we weren't rushing. There wasn't the, the thought of, of, of arriving at the bottom of the valley and it being late at night or, 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 or 
anything else kind of going on. So it was it was a nice, pleasant day. The roads were quiet as well. And uh, in relation to deciding how to stop, I believe that the Mercedes works in a similar system to the Tesla, which I've used before, where you, you plug in on the in-car screen your destination and then it plots the different stops for you along the way. Yeah, that's it. So I don't think I, um, I don't think I realised the power of this almost like driving assistant. Um, and and yeah, we 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 put in our final destination, um, say on on day one, uh, and it really was explicit with telling us where we needed to stop, how long we needed to charge for, um, and how much battery we'd have when we arrived. So th- there was some comfort in that. Again, as a, as a still a new to electric driver you know the, these thoughts about being in france and running out of charge on the side of the road were, were all quite sort of uh, yeah prevalent in my head but it was a real extra comfort knowing where we need wh- where we could go and needed to go yeah um, and uh, so during the course of that then i, I believe we chatted uh, you know just before we came on air use the ionity charger network but also there was the opportunity to use some of the tesla chargers as well and you mentioned there's quite a big uh, tesla charger uh, array in Alberville, which you used as your last stop before going up to Valdezere. Yeah, that's it. So um, actually, the, the the Mercedes navigation wasn't telling me to stop there, but just because I didn't know how much charge we'd use getting up the mountain, I'd, I'd read you know read from you about losing battery um, capacity in the cold. And being a little bit unsure about charges in Val d'Azer, I decided we decided to stop there. Uh, and I and I read that the station, the Tesla station, was a Tesla for everyone. I think they call it, uh, and that meant that we just pulled up and plugged in. I downloaded the Tesla app there and then paid on Apple Pay, super easy, and it was very very fast as well. Again, you know, we popped in into the supermarket for for the toilet, came out, and and yeah, we got su- sufficient charge. Excellent, that's good. Just in relation to charges, you said you travelled out around. Uh, you know easter time i think it's probably yeah. in the second week we're in the base did you have any queues for charges at all were you always able to charge straight away not not one queue uh at all i was so impressed with the number of charges on the motorway um and and i, I can pro- i can ping you a photo because I, I took quite a few there were stands of maybe 10 charges all high speed with just us there uh, and 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 there, were, there was definitely no shortage of of electric charging points compared to what I've seen in, 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 you know, on some main roads in the UK, this was, it's quite something. Certainly that's my experience as well of having driven out to the Alps and back. We never had an issue with uh, chargers and there are a lot, you know, well-equipped along the way. I think one of the issues I had, I've done it once in a Tesla where we're using Tesla chargers evidently, uh, and they were very accessible once in a non-Tesla vehicle. And I think that um, we, we weren't actually driving, I'm trying to remember the route now, we did go to Courchevel, so we could have stopped in uh, that Alberville one on the way back, but uh, we were more limited the Arnotti network but that was over a year ago now a year year and a half ago uh having trouble remembering exactly when it was <laughs> uh, and i think you know they've already added another 150 uh, charges to their network in europe so that's certainly improving and i think you told me as well that when you're in resort in val Azaire, you got to top up uh, by charging in the club med where you stayed and then on top of that when you came back downhill you got all the the regen added to the battery as well. I, I had a feeling it would happen, but it it really gave us a boost. So compared to the, I suppose the periods on the way down that we were we were driving and then having to stop, we got. Uh, I worked out that we got three hundred and ten miles uh, from that charge because of the regen and down the hill where you know we weren't using mileage, we were regening, and then and then that meant having left early in the morning we got quite a good chunk of driving done before you know the kids woke up and actually we need to charge again so it really worked really really well excellent so you know overall you know you've said uh you you know relatively new to electric car big decision to go to drive uh to the house and you know it worked really well and i don't know depending how much you've uh, looked into it did you travel by eurotunnel Uh, we did yeah yeah we did yeah so Uh, so eurotunnel has in itself a very uh low carbon cost yeah. Uh, because they're using a uh, renewable electricity most of those um charges if you're using ionity and tesla network are also powered by renewables and mm. the car itself evidently doesn't have any tailpipe emissions so really by driving by electric car to a ski resort and back 
your overall emissions are probably going to be around the 20 kilogram of CO2, which compares to um, 162 per person if you fly. So it really is such a huge uh, difference. And this is what, you know, through the campaign Ski Flight Free, really encouraging people to do. So listener, I appreciate there's evidently a cost of the vehicle. And I suspect that the Mercedes, uh, you know, is probably uh, one of the ones nearer the top of the range. Uh, However, I've seen plenty of people driving out the Alps in very smart cars, uh, but aren't necessarily electric vehicles. So, you know, I think the point, um, yeah, I'm interested in helping to, you know, propagate, helping people to understand is it is entirely possible to drive an electric car uh, in the Alps. And I think your experience, Simon, helps to uh, demonstrate that. So thanks very much for sharing it. No problem at all. Thank you. Excellent. Enjoy your next trip. I'll <laughs> do. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Right, we're going to move towards the end of the show now. I enjoy all feedback about the show, so I'd like to know what you think, ideas for features uh, or anything else like that. Please contact me uh, on social at The Ski Podcast or via email, theskipodcast at gmail.com. I do have a couple of comments since the last podcast. Uh, Alan Foster said, uh, very much enjoy the podcast. Thank you. Lindsay said, great podcast once again. She was referring to episode 173, which was uh, that amazing interview that I did with the guys from British Back country with their skiing in scotland uh joe uh said thanks very much for the feature on action cameras uh really interesting now that was episode 171 and that action camera is actually suggested by a listener so if there's something that you particularly want to hear about then do let me know now there are over 170 episodes of the ski podcast to catch up with i had a quick look and 117 of them were listened to in the last week so there's plenty in our back catalog to uh, catch up with now don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And if you do enjoy the podcast, you can always buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash ski podcast. I'd like to thank uh, Joe for uh, getting me a couple of cups of tea in the last week. Now, you can follow me at Skipedia and the podcast at Ski Podcast. But for now, I'd like to thank Les Toivale for sponsoring the show and thank my guest today, Babsy. Thanks. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And Steve. Ian, thanks so much, mate. Okay, and I think we're all looking forward to National Snow Week in the autumn in October. But finally, listener, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.